great to see so many people uh, having turned out and uh, yeah thanks a lot Ace for the opportunity to, um, to speak to you all. Um, unfortunately Andrew Kempton from uh, Fonterra and Auckland was supposed to be down to present but um, fortunately had a prior engagement in Wellington so you're stuck with me but hopefully um, you'll still get a, a fair bit out of it. So I have sort of changed our presentation around slightly. Um, something far more interesting around data and numbers. So I'm sure everyone's going to be enthralled about that. But um, without further ado, we'll move on. So I guess Fonterra um, collects a whole lot of data. And I know if there's Fonterra farmers in the room, they'll be looking at going, oh God, you know, we're in the middle of doing our farm dairy records and every other thing. So I thought it might be interesting just to have a wee look at, you know, where does all this data come from and what do we do with it? And how might that help both Fonterra as a as an organisation in the future and also our farmers um, into the future. So I guess the first thing is we get a whole lot of data from our farm dairy records. So at the end of the season, farmers will be doing it at the moment, we collect a whole lot of um, data on herd numbers, farm sizes, you know, what supplements and feed, etc, etc. And from that we also have 20% of our farms that go through an audit process on those records. So. That's one of our sort of a key sources of data. Moving forward, obviously, milk quality. So we, every time the milk tanker pulls up the driveway, it takes a sample of, of your milk. Um, that gets tested, so we get a huge amount of data from that. As the tanker pulls into the factory, milk gets tested. As it leaves the factory, it gets tested. As it goes offshore, it gets tested. So again, huge amount of data collected from our milk quality. On farm, so every dairy farm gets a farm dairy assessment every year. So they are looking at things such as hygiene of the plant, are you keeping decent records, your vet records, and a little bit on the environment as well. Then there's the stuff that I guess I do and our area managers, so our field teams. So again, coming out, speaking with farmers from a sustainable dairy point of view, we produce farm environment plans, so that makes a, that collects a whole lot of data about you know, the good farming practices that are going on on farm, there's a whole lot of mapping that sits in behind that, where your waterways are, uh, farm crossings, etc, etc. And also um, cooperative difference, and for those non-Fonterra farmers, um, this is sort of Fonterra's framework for, I guess, guiding farm practice so it aligns with that strategy, and also um, it looks at how we can incentivise um, farmers to I guess move beyond those minimum standards. And so out of that cooperative difference is things such as animal welfare plans um, and has, a, has some information around people and, and that on farm. So I mean I've only probably touched on it but this is just some of the data that's collected. Um, and obviously you think well okay you collect all this stuff, what do you actually do with it? You know what's the value of it? Why do we want it? You know why do we want all this stuff and, and what value is it to our farmers and to I guess Fonterra as, as a whole? Um, and I suppose a bit like Jeff was talking about, you know, for Fonterra we've got a, a providence story. So a, a story about where our products come from, their origins, their history. And, you know, that really does provide us access to markets and provides value for our products. So more and more people around the world want to know where's that food coming from? How is it made? Is it safe? And they're increasingly turning to companies that um, can prove their sustainability footprint and can and I guess that they trust. And I guess our provenance story is what will drive more value and market share over time. Um, just as some examples, so the market claims you can see up there, um, they really developed due to increasing demand from our customers and they want to have certi certifiable claims that they can put on their packaging um, that they were selling so that they could gain a premium. And I guess as a Fonterra example of this in the US, um, we use the uh, grass-fed little symbol there on our anchor butter and that of course makes it stand out from those um, butters that are produced in the States which generally are in, inside, cows inside etc. So that again differentiates our product from, um, from others in the States and obviously also allows us to charge a premium for that. Um, again also our customers in terms of ingredients, um, oops, back there. Customers in terms of the ingredients they use, they want to purchase products that um, if they're making a, a GMO free product then they can use our ingredients and they can put on that uh, little seal so to speak. 
And if we couldn't offer that, then it's likely those customers would go elsewhere. So they go elsewhere, and again, we not only miss out on the premium, we miss out on the sale of the actual product itself. And I guess just to link that back to those farm dairy records, so if you look at the um, non-GMO and grass-fed sort of claims, they all link back to the structures, supplementary feeds, crops, etc. that data we collect in our farm dairy records. You look at the, um, the cared for cows claim, again links back to the, the questions that are answered in the um, health and welfare section of the farm dairy records. So okay, you think oh, that's all very well and good, but what actual value does that provide to our farmers and, and Fonterra as a whole? So again, just a few stats. So 2019, about 97 million extra value gained through the use of those um, those seals and, and um, certifiable claims. And then we fast forward a year, uh, last year was 150 million above and beyond that. So you get to see you know, the impact that this is having, the revenue that it's actually generating for Fonterra and obviously um, our farmers. So I guess enough on um, the global side of things, let's have a bit of a look at you know, what sort of things we can use some of this data for in terms of our farmers. So, we can gain some insights into efficiencies on farm, so can we be more efficient? And also understand that environmental risk and what that might mean for farmers in the future. So I'm just gonna give a, a little bit of a talk around our environment report. Some of the new things we look at in terms of purchase nitrogen surplus, so sort of as a, a substitute or um, to overseer. Um, some of the benchmarking we're doing, then just a little bit of an insight into some of the, the new things that um, are on the horizon that we haven't actually released yet. So for uh, Fonterra farmers, you've probably all seen this, but um, our envir environment report, it, it features our nitrogen risk scorecard and our greenhouse gas emissions report. Um, has some key outputs, obviously, purchase nitrogen surplus, which is simply nitrogen being bought in minus what goes out in product. Um, and also has a, um, your greenhouse gas emissions as well. And I guess, quite importantly, it identifies some of the, the key management practices that um, influence nitrogen risk loss on your dairy farm. Um, we've also got some benchmarking in there, and I guess the final page also provides a bit of an overview of your climatic conditions that obviously can influence just how much nitrogen will be lost from your farming system. Um, so what is this purchase nitrogen surplus? As I said, um, it's the difference between the amount of nitrogen coming into your farming system versus that leaving. So coming in via fertiliser and imported feed, going out in terms of dairy farm uh, milk. If you're a sheep and beef farm, it might be products sold, obviously. Um, higher, higher number uh, basically means that you may not be using nitrogen efficiently, or you could use it more efficiently. And as a result, there's a higher risk of nitrogen loss to the environment. And I guess when we actually achieve some reductions in nitrogen surplus through um, efficiency improvements, um, we can actually get some financial benefits, so some reduced costs. So I guess this is not the same as your overseer number, um, so it's not to be confused with that. Overseer takes um, nitrogen surplus and it divides it up using a series of models into what stays in the ground, what goes into the atmosphere, what's lost to water. Um, and the overseer loss number has a, I guess it's significantly influenced by your climate and your soils. So you can't really use it to benchmark across farms. You can have a really low overseer in loss number but be really inefficient. So the whole idea of purchase nitrogen surplus and one of the key benefits of it is you can start to compare across farms, across um, you know, your farm versus you know, others in a catchment or your farm versus other farms that are producing a similar amount of milk solids. And so that's sort of what we've done um, last year for the first time we started looking at some of some simple sort of benchmarking just to give I guess farmers an idea of where they sit compared to um, other farmers in their reference group. So for example this was a Otago Southland farm, you can see the benchmark uh, groups up there but this one was benchmarked in farms producing over 1350 kgs of milk solids per hectare. So looking at that you go okay, well I'm up there, 225, you know, why am I using significantly more nitrogen than the average farm to produce a similar amount of milk solids? And there could be some very good reasons for that, but you know, you've got some potentials there to, to then start looking at some efficiency gains and potentially reducing some business costs. So you know, are we using our nitrogen um, 
efficiently? Are we you know, making sure our round length is long enough so we're actually in the full value from it? So there's some things here you can start to look at that potentially don't cost you any money, don't cost you anything in terms of production, but um, potentially save you a bit of money. And we're currently, I guess, um, developing a range of other tools. So this was, I guess, the first iteration of it. Um, we're hoping we'll be able to also provide tools that you can go on to the FarmSource website and start looking at, okay, can I compare my purchase nitrogen surplus to others in my catchment, whether I'm uh, on farm wintering, other farms that are system five. So a whole lot of different options that we're still looking at there. Um, and just as an aside, we've done a similar thing with greenhouse gases as well. So you can start to look at some of the, you know, the basic benchmarking. So for the farm in the, at the bottom there, so they're emitting about 9.3 or 9 kgs of CO2 equivalents for every kg of milk solids produced. And you can see on the graph there, that they're probably at the slightly higher end in terms of um, CO2 emissions versus milk solids produced. So again, you might start to, as we move further down the greenhouse gas emissions and, and more mitigation start to be developed, you might start to look at things you could do to bring that back the other way. So one of the new things that we've released in the last couple of weeks is our digital insights report. So when you submit your farm view records, you, you had to wait about three months for the report to come out and by that time you'd sort of probably forgotten about what you even put into it. So now as soon as you put in your data, you automatically get directed to this insights report. And that gives you a high level overview of what inputs you put in. You can look and go, oh geez, does anything stand out there as being wrong? So you know if you if your cages of nitrogen per hectare was somewhere at 400, you might go, hold on, I've obviously put some wrong data in there. So again, that's sort of just a, a basic look at, um, have I got things right? But from there, you can start to then drill down to some of these management practices that I talked about. So, you know, for example, on this one here, you see, oh, nitrogen fertiliser, very high. Hmm, wonder why that is. So you can drill down again, and you can start to get a bit of an idea of, of why that might be the case. So in, in the case of this farm, they were using about 185 kgs of N per hectare, so possibly on the higher side for, for Southland. Um, but drilling down again to the next one, about six kgs of milk solids for every um, kg of N used. So if you're looking at a um, you know, highly efficient farm, that could be 10, maybe even 12. So again, it just gives you some indication, some of the things you can start looking at around your nitrogen use. So for example, you know, we might look at, okay, um, is there an opportunity here to look at um, summer applications of N? You know, are your clovers actually doing the job for you? Can you skip around? Is your round length long enough? There's a whole lot of um, different tools that are being developed through DRNZ that um, can actually help reduce your, your nitrogen fertiliser um, usage, but actually uh, not affect your production. So that's some of the stuff we're sort of looking at and offering support to farmers into the future around how you might actually do that. And then just, this hasn't been released yet, but um, one of the things we're looking at around cooperative difference is providing some insight reports into that as well. So uh, for example, up there we've got milk, animals, cooperative and prosperity. So they're some of the five focus areas from cooperative difference. So on the left hand side, um, this was a Canterbury example, but again, benchmarking your somatic cell counts versus you know other other farms in your region against Frontier as a whole, and then giving an idea of you know, what that might be costing you compared to sort of the average. So it gives you, you know, sort of a monetary value on that. Same with animals, looking at heat stress, lameness, and then milking efficiency, which I've got a little bit more detail on. So um, this is really looking at your month of peak milk, looking at your stats as to you know, how long is it taking to milk, how much milk are you collecting. And this is coming through your farm vat, milk, uh, your farm vat monitoring that is a sort of a reasonably recent addition. And from that you can start to look at, okay, how long is it taking to milk my cows compared to other sheds and other herds of a similar size? So in this case, this was benchmarked against a 50 to 55 bale rotary. You can see for this farm, um, it's taking 80, 80, he's milking 80 cows per hour. That's quite a bit lower than the average, which is just over 100. You drill down again and you can start to see, okay, he's getting about 90 litres of milk per cluster per hour. And using some of the work um, out of max T or maximum um, milking time efficiencies, that could, if you were sort of around 80 to 100% of being of full efficiency for that dairy, for that dairy seed size and herd, you could potentially save yourself nine to sort of 11 hours per week in the shed. So 
that's just one example of some of the tools that um, potentially will be available in the future for farmers um, using some of that data. And I see I've just sort of touched on a few of the things that are, are sort of coming through. There's a whole lot of other stuff in terms of um, obviously our phone apps for the digital dairy diary, being able to record different things and how that all links together into various um, apps to try and streamline this whole process. So I will leave it there and yeah, thank you very much.